Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can check them out at filmmakeru.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Every week I'm joined by a professional to discuss their work. And this week I'm joined by editor Hank Corwin, whose work includes Vice, The Big Short, and most recently on Netflix, Don't Look Up. Welcome to the show, Hank. Thank you so much, Gordon. Now, um, I guess my one of my questions is you've had a really interesting career because you've gone from natural born killers and, you know, Nixon and what have you up to Don't Look Up. So you have this wide range of different genres and styles of, of filmmaking um what is what is something you've taken from those more serious uh and or i guess drama driven films like uh um your earlier work that you use on things like uh big short or this with the comedy aspect of it the lack of cynicism is is perhaps the the for me, the most resonant thing that I've taken from mm -hmm. my earlier work, which was much more serious, much more dramatic. Mm -hmm. Now, on something like Don't Look Up, uh, it's a lot about satire. And I'm wondering, what do you look for in the rushes uh, to make the humor land? Because, you know, if you go too serious, people will take it seriously. <laughs> yeah. If you go too loose, then the satire doesn't work as well. So how do you assess the rushes in a movie like Don't Look Up? You know, I think, I think for me anyway, what I try to do in, in most of these things, but especially in, in, in Don't Look Up, is try to find the most truthful performances. You know, if it's really obvious to me that somebody's joking around, it's probably not going to work in the film. Unless it's something we need, if it's Jonah Hill and he's and he's he's doing a Jonah Hill, and we we need it as 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 counterpoint, that's that's great. But I I mean I like I like humor at least in this film to be much more of like the uh, awareness of this existential plight, mm -hmm. uh, and just the the way like so called normal people would be dealing with these extraordinary situations. So I just try to make my characters as, as real and as truthful as possible. You know, I don't come from a world of comedy. Adam McKay does. Yeah. You know, so I, I have to trust him as my director to know when we're going over the line. You know, I honestly, when I started cutting this film and I worked very closely with Nick Bertel, who's our composer, uh, mm -hmm. He, he did like Succession. He he's he did Moonlight. He's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but we we talked about this, and I always saw the I saw the beginning of this film as being much more emotional and much more operatic. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of the way we ended the film, the last ten or fifteen minutes of the film. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, it's 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 a give and take with, for me with Adam. Just it's a give and take as to how funny is funny and, and how far to push it. We had, uh, you, you've seen the film, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a kind of a loaded question, but uh, <laughs> the, we had a, just a hellish time trying to figure out the tone in the first Oval Office scene because mm -hmm. you had these fantastic actors, I mean, who are arguably some of the best, some of the, the most well-known actors in the world today. Mm -hmm. And they had two days and they, they followed a script, but they were riffing and they were tremendously funny. You know, so through the course of the film, I had, to, I had to attenuate that one scene. Sometimes it was too funny and it would, it would throw the balance off later on. Or if it wasn't funny enough, the middle of the movie became very dirge-like. It, it, yeah. it was almost like a funeral. Well, that, that was going to be one of my questions is how did you find such an interesting balance because of the dark content of it essentially because it's referencing what we're going through, you know, with, uh, well, referencing, I guess, like, uh, you know, it's like we're coming, we have, um, 
an environmental disaster, but in the film, it's uh, something else. So how do we, how did you find that balance since it was such dark humor? You know, I would love to give you a very simple answer, but the truth of the matter is that we were cutting that scene through the duration of the cutting of the entire movie. Mm -hmm. What we would, it was, it was in a way like playing a game of a, a, some kind of a three-dimensional game of chess where you wouldn't see where the moves landed for another 20 minutes, you know? So we would be cut, you know, I would, I would cut, I would cut that scene, say it were, if, if the scene had been very funny, the way I'd cut it, I, you know, I would, well, I'd have the rest of the movie cut and the scene, the screening the film, especially for an audience where you actually feel how they're, how they're feeling as opposed to looking at cards and, 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 and getting, and getting uh, studio reactions, you know, so we would sit in and be able to sort of feel when people got distracted or when they, when they thought things were trite. And then we would go back and, and rework that one Oval Office scene. And this went on for months and months, Gordon. You know, Adam is a big believer in, unlike most directors I've ever worked with, in the screening process. You know, and again, it's not for cards. It's not for scores. It's just to be able to sit with an audience. And that, that was something because we were doing it virtually. Um, and just feeling how they're feeling and watching their reactions. It's so interesting to think because virtually it'd be so hard to gauge. Because like anytime I've been at a screening, you can feel if something's not working. How you know, did that you, work? You're absolutely right. For me, I mean, I hated, I hated that aspect. The good news is we had enough live screenings that I was able to, I was able to feel those. You know, I, it was interesting because in the virtual screenings, they have cameras on the audience. They have cameras behind the audience and they, many different angles. And I found that if somebody real, if people were really laughing and they loved the movie, they became my favorite characters. And so I, that, that was not why I should have been watching the, uh, the, 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 the preview, you know? So it, it was a little bit fraudulent, but again, of course, because we were able to do this live uh, in very controlled circumstances, we were able to get a, a, a good vibe on what worked and what didn't. Now I'd heard that, you know, I've heard different stories about screenings and how people like to utilize them. Um, and, you know, in one, I heard one editor talk about they were placing mics in there to pick up the sound uh, and then laying that in as a laugh track to see, you know, because you see it live, it's hard to remember where they, what worked and what didn't. So they place it in afterwards on the Avid to see where they laughed and where they didn't and then restructure. Is that, how do you guys like to You know, I think, you know, Adam is such a, a connoisseur of comedy. I think that would be a little beneath him. And okay. honestly, I... I just, just in principle, it's too, it's, it's too by the numbers, you know, I mean, it, it really is an art form. And although, you know, you may have, you may have a moment that, that, that makes people laugh in the flow of things. It may not, it may not be important. As a matter of fact, that laugh may be hurting you in the flow, you know, especially if, if ultimately you want, you want to make a serious point. So no, we, we, we again just use these screenings to determine how people are feeling overall and and compare them to how we're to, to compare their feelings to how we're feeling. And you know, we'll have a post-mortem right after the screening and just go through it sort of exhaustively and just talk about it. What is there because you talk about, you know, they would ad lib during this, and that it seems like it'd be one of the tougher things to cut because every take is different. Um, was there anything that was ad lib that uh, got left on the cutting room floor that you really enjoyed but just didn't work for the film? Yeah, no. In the uh, in the the infamous Oval Office scene, mm -hmm. I had uh, I had Meryl Streep looking for her cigarettes crawling under her desk. 
And it was hilarious. I mean, the, there's so much just in that scene alone that yeah. died a, a, a painful and terrible death. And not that I didn't try, because I try to make those those shots work. And they and they did work in I cut that scene when I first cut it, it was magnificent. But it was like 16 minutes long. And when we played it for an audience in in the flow, it was it it was death, you know. Mm. <laughs> We, we knew right away that, that we had to cut it down and uh, we had to make it more serious. Wow. Now, you, you've worked with Adam for several films now. How do you get on the same page with the director and, and build that relationship? You know, it's hard, especially if you're, you're starting out. Mm -hmm. You basically have to adapt to the director. I've, I've reached a point in my life where I want to like the person I'm working with. Um, you know, so when he hired me to, to come on to the big short, he was shooting in New Orleans. I was on my way actually to Prague to do a, a, a television commercial. And I stopped and, and we spent a bunch of hours just talking. And honestly, I didn't, I, I love the script, but I, I didn't think I would be good for it because Adam, Adam is a comedy guy. He comes from comedy. And I, I just didn't know whether I had the chops. Mm -hmm. uh, and he just made me feel comfortable and, and safe and confident. And that's been sort of the hallmark of our relationship. You know, editors have to feel safe in uh, any time they're, uh, they're trying new things. You know, because if they don't, if you feel... I've worked with directors who, who, um, hold on just a sec. Sure. Can you, can you say something? I think I might yeah. have lost hey, a lot. Okay, I've got you. Yeah. I can. Uh, I'm so sorry. No, no I, you know, working with Adam just made me feel safe. And that's, as, as, that's really an important thing for an editor because what we do is so, it's such a tightrope mm -hmm. and you're inherently, insecure i i always i'm so full of self-doubt and half the time self-loathing and i you know if you work with a director who doubts your work it just sort of amplifies it and it becomes this this, this terrible loop mm -hmm. you know so i look for a director who makes me feel comfortable and who's willing to go way out with me out and and maybe fail you know because you have to fail mm -hmm. And just pull it back and 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 work things through. I've gotten to the point where I, with Adam, where he can just leave me alone for weeks at a time, and I'll show him things. He he's wonderful in that he makes me feel so great and that he loves everything. He sort of reels me in and then he he clobbers me. You know he, <laughs> you know. But that's our way. And I yeah. I I I love the guy. He's my friend, and I work for him. I mean that's something you can never forget. What is something, because that Good like day. I think about The Big Short. Pardon me? And, sorry, and I think about The Big Short and how, um, you know, like you guys would cut to, um, you know, I think it was Margot Robbie in the bathtub explaining yeah. heavy content. So he's also taking big chances and experimenting in a sense. Is there a scene or uh, was there something that you experimented with that um, you were really proud of that ended up in, in one of the films? Well, Matt, that there, there are always little things. I think one of the first things I cut, they brought me in, uh, they'd been shooting, they brought me in and I just really wanted to push that material because it was so dense. And I saw that it, the film itself could, could be really deadly mm -hmm. unless I brought some life to it. So, uh, it was the scene where Christian Bale is sitting with the Goldman Sachs bankers. Mm -hmm. And then I put in a ludicrous video, shake your money maker. I think it is. And it was sort of a test for Adam. You know, I, I'll say it now. Um, I wanted to see how he would react. And I intercut scenes of Bale and Bill, Bill and the, the Goldman Sachs people and Bale and his family and what was going on socially and politically at the time of in, in 2008. And uh, 
I, I just love that. But I also knew that certain directors might fire me for it because it was just so far off the mark. And I was just very fortunate that Adam loved it and he wanted that in his film. So I, I ended up really loving that scene because it was just a total chance. What is it that you look for in a script when you're, when you're looking for a script? You know, I think it's, for me, it's got to mean something. It's got to be important. Uh, I, if it's just, I don't do, I don't do things for a paycheck. I mean, I can, I can do television commercials for a paycheck, which are just half the time they're, they're, well, they're a lot less time and they're more lucrative per hour, Mm -hmm. you know? So I, I try to find something that really moves me. Every, I've tried on every film that I've taken to make it really important to me, to make it really resonate with me. I think, and I can't speak for other editors. I always try to have a subtext about what what a movie is about, what a scene is about, and uh, and if I if 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 the film doesn't have the room for that, then it's I'm probably not the right guy to cut it. Is there is there a particular film that you're most proud of? I mean, you've got such a great, like a crazy body of work. You know, I did this one movie. It's called Snow Falling on Cedars mm-hmm. with Scott Hicks. It, it sort of got buried. Um, I'll never forget uh, when I showed it. I was sort of new to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I went to the studio to show it, uh, I won't say who the editor was. They had, they had an in-house editor. And at the end of it, he, <laughs> he reached out to shake my hand And he said, my condolences. (laughs) And, you know, I love that film. If you look at it, it's so, you know, I've been a little bit pegged for a style. If you look at that film, it's just really lyrical and beautiful Mm -hmm. and, and, and simple. And just, it was shot beautifully by Bob Richardson. Uh, And uh, that may be my favorite movie. Also, I, I always, I, I love, I love the problem children. I love the, I love the films that, that may not be getting the affection they should be, mm-hmm. you know, and I loved working with the director, Scott Hicks. So is that one, like, would you say, like, is there a film that you wish more people had seen? Would that be Snow Falling on Cedars or is there another one? You know, I could, because I don't know about the performances on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Nixon was beautiful. Oliver Stone's Nixon uh, with Anthony mm-hmm. Hopkins. And that was so deep and so beautiful. That's a, I think, I think that was a fantastic movie and I wish more people had seen that. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think that's one. I love my work with Terry Malick, with Terrence mm-hmm. Malick. Um, but he's not for everybody. I get that. Um, yeah. We did something called the new world, which was just glorious. Well, and his cinematography is just stunning. Like, isn't it something? Choose, it's just, yeah. It's like watching. Yeah. It's like watching a, a Tarkovsky's mirror or something, where it's just absolutely stunning. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And he's, he's just such a lovely, wonderful guy. And we just would get lost in discussions. It, it, it was very, it was very Socratic. You know, mm-hmm. it was, it was like a, uh, it was like an academy, in yeah. in, in in the Greek sense, where 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 people talked and it was very collegial and it was just a beautiful experience and nobody saw the movie. Well, I saw it. So (laughs) I'm glad. Thank you. Um, I have one last question for you. You know, we've been stuck in this pandemic for two years now. uh, And a lot of people have turned to streaming services to sort of pass the time when they get stuck at home for quarantine. Is there a show or a movie you've discovered over the past year that people should check out? You know, honestly, I've I've watched Succession over and over. I've watched uh, this. This is this is embarrassing. I've watched The Crown over and over because it's just so beautifully made mm-hmm. and beautifully, just beautifully concepted and edited. Uh, I and I've I've looked at just gobs of of clips on the internet. Mm-hmm. You know, I love to see what people are shooting, how they're seeing their world. And so I think the majority of my time has just been 
me just looking at things on the internet, just looking at the, the craziest, the craziest little videos. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview you today. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Gordon. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, that's it for this week, everyone. Uh, make sure to check out filmmakeru.com for all our latest courses. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.